All right, back with small bell, follow through, and B. I'll try to make this B. Um, small bell, follow through, we're looking at the three parts of the small intestine. So duodenum, jejunum, ileum. And you know from anatomy class, right? Duodenum is your first section. It's the smallest, shaped like a C. Uh, it contains the major and minor duodenal papilla, and that's how they gain access, say, to your ERCP. Um, and then jejunum is um, the second segment. It contains the mucosal folds. It has a feathery appearance. So you can see here it looks a little bit um, stripy almost compared to the other two sections. And then the ileum is the last section. The end of it is called the terminal ileum. It connects to the um, large intestine via the ileocecal valve. And so that's where the small valve series will stop. Um, it's sometimes called a timed sequence study, meaning that we take timed uh, images on certain intervals. This can be radiologist preference, but usually it's around like 20 minutes, 25 minutes, or 30 minutes in between. Um, we're going to evaluate the form and function of the small intestine. The timing of the images starts when the patient first starts drinking the contrast. Um, images are done as prone. We put the patient for a prone abdomen to compress the bowel and spread it out for the radiologist to see a little bit better. At the end, when it reaches the terminal ileum, they'll go into the fluoroscopy room for what we call a TI, and they'll do images at the TI and ileocecal valve looking for um, any areas of concern. So they do this whole study, and sometimes it takes hours um, but they have to get all the way through the small bowel, reach the large intestine connection um, to see if anything is wrong. So uh, these were just example images. Uh, you can see as the time sequence gets further along, it moves into the different areas of the intestine. Contrast enema. Um, so this is going to evaluate large intestine. Um, and so colon, ascending, your uh, right hepatic flexure, transverse, left splenic, descending, sigmoid, and rectum. Um, the flexures are hard to see because they're folded over by the transverse colon. And the position of the transverse colon is really similar to that concept of, remember the fundus in the stomach sits posteriorly? Well, the transverse colon sits anteriorly, so in the front. Um, so we're able to evaluate where the barium sits. You will use the Sims position for tipping, and I apologize, I'm not sure why this showed up as blank, but um, just remember that the max height um, for the BE bag is 24 inches. For contrast enemas, we have an option. It's either single contrast or double. Single contrast is contrast only. This could be barium, it could be water-soluble contrast, whatever they need or double contrast. Double always means contrast plus air. These are just examples of um, overheads that might be requested. You can notice that a lot of them are similar. They both have a supine or a prone. There's an axial sigmoid you can do for both. The difference lies between um, the single contrast uses oblique positioning where the double uses the cubes. They both have a lateral rectum the double just use the cross table, and then it could be a post evac. I'm gonna go through these with you, but just so you have an idea of what's done for each one. Supine and prone, when you're looking at a single contrast, there's no air. So single is contrast only. So they're gonna fill the colon, it's gonna look solid, um, and they're looking to evaluate the anatomy. When it's a double, you're gonna notice there's contrast in areas, but there's also parts uh, that have air. When your patient is supine, remember the transverse colon sits anteriorly, so it's raised up. So if your patient's laying on their back, their transverse colon is the highest point. Air rises, fluid drops, right? So the transverse colon is going to fill with air, where the ascending and descending will now have contrast. If the patient goes prone, it's reversed. When you're prone, the transverse colon is the lowest point, so the fluid, or barium, is going to flow into the transverse colon, like this here, and then ascending and descending will then have the air. 
So if you're looking at the two pictures, look to the transverse colon. This one is filled with air, so it has to be supine. This one has barium, so it has to be prone. And look to the spine, just like we did for the stomach imaging. Are your spinous processes coming straight down the middle? How about your pelvis? If you can see the pelvis, does it look flat? Yes? Then they're supine or prone. It's not an oblique. Single contrasts, we're going to do oblique views. The obliques are looking for the flexures. If you remember, your transverse colon sat in front of the flexures. They're kind of folded over. So to see them, you have to oblique the patient. Posterior obliques are going to open the flexure that's away or farthest from the IR. So LPO is going to open the right or hepatic flexure. RPO is going to open the left or the splenic flexure, so side up. What if they tell you they're anterior obliques? Guess what? It's opposite. Anything with x-ray, if you flip it over, you're seeing the opposite side. And one of my students taught me um, that when it says LAO, she always thinks left always open. So if it's anterior obliques, it's going to be the side closest or same side. So LAO opens the splenic flexure. RAO, right always open, shows the right or hepatic flexure. Remember, there's an oblique pair. There's always an oblique pair. So an REO and LPO are your options for right hepatic, LAO, RPO, left splenic. Double contrast. I say double equals decubitus. So double contrast involves contrast and air. And on the double, we're looking for the mucosal lining. So we're looking side up. And you know, anytime you do a decubitus view with a horizontal beam, we're looking for some sort of fluid air separation, right? We're going to do a right lateral decubitus and a left lateral decubitus. How do you know which side is down and which side is up? I look to the contrast. Remember, contrast is heavy. It's going to flow to the lowest point. Contrast is going to be the side down. Air will be side up. One other hint that I was taught is the left flexure is always higher than the right. So you can see the left flexure is high here over this one. So I know this is a right lateral decubitus because the fluid is sitting on this side and this is the right flexure. And this one is vice versa. So if you look here, say the picture is standing up like this one. How would you know it's a decubitus? Well, you're not going to get these air fluid lines, these, these straight lines, when the person is standing. So this was done in a decubitus, just rotated straight up. Anytime you see this clear definition between air and fluid, it's a decubitus. And what have we learned? Fluid drops to the lowest point. So where the barium is going, that's the side down. This is the highest flexure, which is the left. This is a left lateral decubitus. I know it's decubitus because I can see air fluid levels. So I know it has to be a double contrast. What is the area of interest? The air side. The mucosal lining, or they're looking at the side up. So medial descending, lateral ascending. Right lateral decubitus, the complete opposite. So where's the barium? It's pooling down here. This is the lower flexure, it's the right. This is the higher flexure left, so I know it's right side down. We're looking at this air side, lateral descending, mucosal line. Lateral rectum. Both your single and double contrast will use a lateral rectum. The uh, single contrast is just regular recumbent lateral. Um, I think it looks a lot like a sacrum coccyx position. You just move forward a little bit. The area of interest is the rectal sigmoid region. The double, the variance is that you're going to do a cross table lateral. Why? Ah, air and fluid. So the patient is in a prone or ventral decubitus position. You have a horizontal beam. You put your cassette next to the patient instead of in the bucky tray like this one. So you can see a clear air fluid separation here. So I know this is a double contrast cross table, and this is a single. The axial sigmoid, um, or sometimes called the butterfly position. So axial sigmoid, guess what? It's done for the sigmoid colon. Um, the sigmoid colon is really kind of curled onto itself. 
So to help with that, there is a significant angle put on. So a 30 to 40 degree cephalad angle if the patient is supine. If they're prone, you're gonna reverse it, right? With anything, when we flip it over, you're gonna reverse. So if it's a prone axial sigmoid, you're gonna do 30 to 40 caud ad. I was taught, if the toes are up, you angle up. Toes down, angle down. One thing I want you to remember here is going back to your image production. How do we elongate something, elongate anatomy? Remember, you can elongate or foreshorten. To elongate, it has to be a tube angle or angle of the image receptor. To foreshorten, it has to be part angulation. So this image could be used, say, as an image production question. We're elongating this area using a tube angle. You can also see a variance in the pelvis, right? The pelvis looks sharp. You can see sharp white lines instead of the flat wings of the pelvis. So we know this is the AP axial sigmoid. A, it's centered lower. It's focused on the sigmoid. There's a clear tube angle and distortion of anatomy here. Look at those obturator foramen. They're gigantic. Um, so just some tips on that. And then post evac and scout. Um, I doubt this will be really a focus for you for ART, but scout is always done beforehand and you should annotate on the image. Scout. Uh, post evac, the patient uh, may be asked to get up and try and evacuate as much of the contrast as they can, and you'll take a post um, evacuation abdomen image. Um, you can usually decrease your technical values a little bit because uh, they've maybe evacuated most of the contrast, but um, fairly simple. If you can take a KUB, you can do BE imaging. It's essentially centering at the crest and doing KUBs. It's just knowing position-wise, where's the barium? And then your types of contrast, just a quick review on that. Um, positive versus negative contrast. So we know our positive contrast is gonna be our contrast media. So you're gonna use barium or isoview, a, a water soluble. Um, so barium sulfate uh, is really easy um, as far as less possibility of reactions. It never dissolves in water. It's considered a colloidal suspension and it has the atomic number of 56. Water soluble contrast should be used on any study that's questioning perforation. Um, so it's water soluble, it has iodine um, base in it. So if, if perforation is a question on your study, you should be using this over barium because the body can absorb it and excrete it. Your negative contrast is your air. And so any double contrast, that's where you're gonna see it. Uh, just some terminology here quick. Uh, ionic versus non-ionic contrast. Ionic has a greater chance of reaction because it has a high osmolarity. And non-ionic has less of a chance uh, because low osmolarity. And um, I know osmolarity and viscosity tends to be two terms that people confuse just a little bit. But the osmolarity is the concentration of the iodine particles in the solution. And if it's a high osmolarity, it has a higher concentration of particles than blood. And higher iodine gives you higher osmolarity, meaning higher chance of possibility of reaction. The lower osmolarity has less particles, meaning it has less of a chance of reaction. So ideally, we use the non-ionic contrast. Viscosity is gonna be the thickness of the suspension. So you think like, you know, is it maple syrup thickness <laughs> or something like that? Um, how thick it is will affect the ability to flow through, say, the needle for the injection or flow through um, the blood vessels. Obviously, a higher viscous solution is harder to inject. So osmolarity is your number of particles and then viscosity is the overall thickness of the suspension. So I hope that was helpful.